is Jay and welcome back to the channel. And welcome back to Boomy Reptile Sanctuary. It's been a while, I believe it's been a couple weeks since I last uploaded a Boomy Reptile Sanctuary video. And we're back with a bang, we're doing a habitat I've been waiting for for quite a while. We're doing a Pygmy Hippo Habitat. Now, a Pygmy Hippo is definitely not a reptile. Don't worry, I'm not going to pull a, a little bit of a bamboozle the way I did with the whole bird to reptiles thing. Nope, hippopotamuses, hippopotami, hippopotamodes, I'm not sure. I would just say hippos. They're definitely not reptiles. 100% I can assure you, unless you want to be ridiculously phylogenetic and say that everything's a reptile because they originated from reptiles, but if you want to do that you might as well call me a fish. A bit of a phylogenetic humor there for you. Um, obviously, did not land. I can already predict that. So <laughs> oh god, this is often an interesting start, isn't it? Anyway, so today we're we're doing the pygmy hippo habitat, and we're doing it on this island in the middle of our body of water. It's a big lake that kind of surrounds the whole park, and I thought this island's a good spot for the pygmy hippo habitat. I'm kind of very loosely basing this off one that I saw when I was at Singapore Zoo. They've got a family unit of pygmy hippos that live within this really cool habitat where they kind of have their own little island and you have these little huts that you can go into and view the pygmy hippos from where it's kind of um semi underwater viewing where you can both see the terrestrial area and also the underwater area. So I got some amazing shots of the pygmy hippo while I was there and you'll see that in my upcoming Singapore Zoo video. But it gave me loads of inspiration for this particular habitat, so you're going to see me construct an underwater viewing area in sort of this wooden hut type situation. And we also have an above ground viewing area on the other side of the island, so you get multiple viewing angles. And it's kind of um, a habitat where you'd walk into one part of it, say the underwater viewing area. You'd leave and you think, oh yeah, we're done with the pygmy hippos. And then later on, when you're in another part of the park, you're suddenly going to realize, oh, there's another, you know, like a little, a little path that heads off towards somewhere that says hippos. What could this be? And you go down the path and turns out it's another viewing area for the pygmy hippos and you might get a different view of them that you might not have had previously. So I thought that would be a bit of a cool idea. As far as the hippos themselves are concerned, um, I'm a big fan. Pygmy hippos are one of my favorite animals. I think they're just the coolest. They're absolutely adorable. The first time I've ever seen one in real life was 2015, I believe, at London Zoo, where I saw their, their pair of pygmy hippos. And again, so, so, so adorable. They're uh, absolutely the cutest thing. They're just like if you squished a big hippo down into a pygmy hippo. Well, you know, appropriate naming, really. <laughs> Anyways, they're a very small hippopotamus type animal. Um, the genus is not hippopotamus like the Nile hippo, which is hippopotamus amphibious. This animal, um, even though it is called the pygmy hippopotamus, it has a different genus name, which is debated. It can either be called the uh, Chiropsis libriensis or Hexaprotodon libriensis. So uh, there's a bit of um, ambiguity regarding the genus name. I am not particularly familiar with the um, the whole naming situation here, so. Uh, someone else who's probably a bit more familiar can like to me in the comments because I'm not entirely sure here. But it is a very cool animal. It behaves very much like a regular hippo. It is semi-terrestrial, semi-aquatic. Um, it is a bit more nocturnal, I believe. So they kind of spend the mornings asleep or in the water and then at dusk they kind of emerge to feed. And they live a lot more in a lot more um, forested environments compared to regular hippos. So you see regular hippos in these big rivers in the African grasslands. You know, there's always those um, really iconic shots from nature documentaries in the Serengeti or, you know, in different parts of the uh, various African savannas. And you always have these really iconic shots where you have big river crossings where loads of wildebeest and stuff cross over and you, in the rivers you have Nile crocodiles prowling and also you have like huge amounts of hippos. And Nile hippos are actually considered the most dangerous animal in Africa because they're just, I mean, they're hefty animals. They're big and they're powerful and they've got these massive tusks. And when it comes to the pygmy hippo, they're not actually, you know, 
as threatening, they're a bit more shy and they're less aggressive. But, you know, they still have all that hardware, they still have the massive tusk and they still have the body plan that's really heavy and really, you know, you wouldn't want to get run over by these things because you probably get flattened. So why is this thing so small anyways? As far as um, science is concerned, we kind of have the idea that this is a result of uh, insular dwarfism. So it's something you usually see on islands. You have island dwarfism um, with a lot of species, but with the pygmy hippopotamus, what we've seen is because they're, um, they're so far inland and they live quite close um, in forested environments and things like that, it's likely that they just got smaller because being smaller in a forested environment just gives you a bit more of an advantage. There's also another theory that these guys are descended from pygmy hippos that used to live on Madagascar, which is again another theory uh, regarding island dwarfism because Madagascar is obviously an island. And there were extinct species on Madagascar such as the Malagasy hippopotamus. So these are all really cool things about this animal. I, I'm a big fan of it. I didn't know much about it until I first spotted it in, you know, in real life at the zoo. And I've been pretty interested in them. I'm not obviously uh, super familiar with the ins and outs of the, uh, how they live and the uh, uh, biology and things like that. Uh, but on a general level, I, I absolutely love them. I think they're such cool animals. They're just interesting, you know? They're not the usual thing you'd see at a zoo. You'd see big hippos, right? Like, they're the big chicken animal. You'd see a big Nile hippopotamus. But you don't often see pygmy hippopotamus. Says pygmy hippos. <laughs> Uh, if I say hippopotamus, it says a pot hippo, pot, pot hip, hippos. That's it. Yeah, hippos. I'm not gonna, not gonna try. But um, yeah, they're just really cool. And I love the fact that they're in this game because they're an animal that reproduces and breeds really well in captivity. And in fact, they do really well in captivity to the point where their lifespans are much longer in captivity by about ten years, I believe. Let me just quickly check that out. Yeah, yeah, decent, decent while longer. It's uh, They live up to 42 to 55 years old in captivity, which is pretty cool. So they're doing quite well. And a uh, really good thing is, again, captive breeding is doing really well. The population has doubled in captivity. However, there's this really curious thing that um, people have noticed where not many of the captive hippo babies happen to be male. Most of them come out female, which is an interesting thing. This has been observed with a few other species where the sex ratios are actually quite odd when you look at captive bred populations. This is possibly entirely due to chance. Again, uh, statistics like this, we're not looking at you know the bigger sample size in the world. We're still looking at maybe a few thousand animals as opposed to you know an ideal number of a few million in the wild. Obviously, they're not a few million in the wild, but again, this. Um, Sex ratio is quite interesting, just to point out, even though it might not have any bearing on actual biology, it might just be because of chance. It's always worth noting because, you know, it might be because of biology, never know. Anyways, this is probably my most rambly video, I just wanted to interject a little bit more science into it. I really love animals and the more I learn about- <coughs> oh, sorry about that. But the more I learn about them, the more I just feel a connection to all these different creatures which really deserve our love and respect and especially you know when you get close to the information about an animal when you start learning so much about them you learn a bit more about how to take care of the world around us how to make sure that these animals that we've come to learn about love and respect how do we keep them safe you know how do we make sure that they're not struggling and unfortunately, with this animal right now, even though I've told you that it's doing really well in captivity, as of right now, it is it is really unsure about their whole um, situation in the wild. As of 2006, I believe there were only 3,000 pygmy hippos left. And while they may have come up since then, and uh, kind of recovered their numbers slightly, it is still quite unsure whether they're, you know, going to survive very well in the wild, which is why captive breeding programs like the ones that are going on in zoos all over the world are so vital to the survival of species just like this. So I do implore you, if you 
do you find yourself learning more about an animal and realizing that it is under threat? Definitely do what you can to raise awareness. I know that not all of us are able to, you know, donate amounts of money or go out into the wild and help animals or, you know, stand in front of a bulldozer. But what we can all do is raise awareness and talk to people. There's so many people in the world who don't even know that pygmy hippos exist, let alone the fact that they're threatened. The animals all over the world are beautiful and they're under threat because of so many different reasons. For example, the pygmy hippo, it's a deforestation. And when it comes to other animals, like um, the pangolin, which we'll probably introduce in a later episode, it's things like poaching for traditional medicine and things like that, all of which don't have a scientific uh, basis to them. So yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my take on that. And now back to the video itself. Now, this habitat I'm not 100% happy with. I did really like the underwater viewing house and the above ground viewing as well. But when it comes to the island itself where the pygmy hippos live, I'm not 100% satisfied. I think I will revisit it in a future episode. The shelter especially, I'm not super happy with. I used a new arctic wood pack um, to build it. And I, I do love how the wood looks, but it looks a bit too clean. And when I try to add some plants like the ivy and these um, creeping roots, they didn't turn out quite how I was hoping. So unfortunately, I think I probably will redo some of it. But otherwise, I am happy with the viewing areas and well, the hippos are very much happy with it too. So you may notice that this is the first animal since our first episode, actually with the flamingos. This is our first animal that's making use of the body of water that surrounds the park. My plan was to get most of the animals that need water using this body of water. So as we go forward, when we get up to the um, the saltwater crocodile and the gharial, we're gonna make use of other parts of this lake because obviously they need lots of water and we're going to introduce them to some of these larger sections of the lake off to the right so kind of across from where the Komodo dragon is at the moment and they're gonna make use of all that space we're gonna probably make it quite large quite a bit larger than the pygmy hippo habitat that we have going on today now besides those two large reptiles, I believe we don't have much left. I'm going to do a pangolin habitat because I really like pangolins and I think they're a great um, addition to this reptile sanctuary. But other than that, I think I might include tapirs actually. Yeah, I, I think I did add some tapirs to my collection um, via the animal trading hub. So we might do those as well. Oh, you know, just, just thinking about it now, I think we might actually have more episodes than I initially thought before we're done with this. And obviously we're going to do the exhibit animals, which are going to have their own little houses. So that'll be quite cool. But yeah, um, that's all I really have to say for... Oh wait, no. <laughs> I've had a bit of an issue with this park. So as of, I think about a week ago when I last played, my ostriches have started reproducing, which is great. The babies are adorable. However, I failed to take into account that these babies are significantly more agile than their adult counterparts. So I don't know if you may have noticed during the time lapse, but there's been an alert on the corner of the screen that kind of perpetually goes off. And that's because my tiny little adorable baby ostriches have decided to do a bit of a prison break and they're running amok. I have about five of them, I believe, and they just keep escaping. I keep having to catch them and put them back, but I didn't take this into account. I thought, yeah, I'm gonna have a habitat for adult ostriches and I made it so they can't escape. But these little guys just run out at every opportunity they can. They can literally hop over everything I put in their path. So I don't know what to do. I may have to do a mini episode where I baby proof this entire habitat. So that might be quite funny, but um, yeah, they were a bit of a pain. They are, however, super cute. So you will see some of them in the cinema cinematics. And to prevent more uh, baby problems, <laughs> I've decided to sp slow down the animal aging in this park by the um, up to five times, which is the one of the new additions from the latest patch that came with the Arctic DLC. And that's going to help slow down all of our animal breeding. We're going to have our babies for longer. 
and hopefully we'll have more time to spend with the animals that we do have and actually get a bit more attached to them. So that'll be quite good I think. And now I am actually done with all the things I need to say. I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. Next I think I'm gonna upload either another Jurassic World Evolution video or another video from Alisund Arctic Wildlife Park which is our Arctic DLC park. I do recommend you give the two habitats that I've built there a watch because I, I really um, am going all out in that park because there's only four animals so I decided to build them all very grandiose uh, over the top habitats that are um, probably not entirely realistic but are definitely kind of what I would love to see in an ideal zoo so that's quite uh, quite interesting. I do like how much work I put into it because the habits are turning out really really amazing um, in my opinion anyways so definitely check that out. In other news we have reached 41 subscribers. Thank you so much to everyone who subscribed. I really hope that you guys are enjoying my content. Um, if you have any suggestions or any critique or feedback please do let me know. Again, I'm really, really appreciative to everyone who watches these videos. It means a lot. And yeah, thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. <laughs>